So how quickly does this process of speciation take place? Is it like an overnight kind of thing? Is it like a millions of years kind of thing? So remember, speciation is when we have something that prevents individuals from breeding or producing offspring. So we're separating populations, keeping those individuals from breeding. And those could be, again, prezygotic barriers, anything that prevents a zygote from forming. Could be behavioral prezygotic barriers, could be physical pre prebiotic barriers, it could be in just separate places, right? If you're not in the same place, you can't make a zygote. Or postzygotic barriers, right? Anything that after the zygote has formed works against that zygote by either decreasing its um, success or making it infertile. Okay. So, but something, something has stopped these individuals from breeding. Then, once those populations are separated, that's when, after separation, each population kind of goes through its own process of evolution, right? Natural selection or other mechanisms of evolution are at work in both groups. So we accumulate genetic changes in both groups individually. After enough time, in theory, they would be different species, right? We're gonna bring them back together. They would be so different that they wouldn't be able to to breed, or if they were able to breed, they wouldn't be able to make a viable hybrid. Okay, but how long does this take? How long do we have to keep those two populations separated before we can call them different species? Well, that's a hard question to answer. It's complicated. There's a lot of factors that go into this. If there's still gene flow between the populations, that obviously slow down the process of speciation. Um, so the more gene flow there is, the less likely that speciation will occur or the slower that speciation will happen. Okay, so we can still have gene flow happen with speciation occurring at the same time. It just slows things down because you're continuing to mix those genes, mix those alleles, which makes those two groups more similar. Okay, speciation is when we have divergence, those groups become different. How quickly do they reproduce? What's their generation time, right? The slower a species is at reproducing and developing, like us as humans or elephants or other large animals, right, whales, the longer this process of speciation would take, in theory, right? Just because it's going to take longer for the next generation, just takes more time for natural selection and other mechanisms of evolution to act on the population to see a change happen. But if you're something like a bacteria, right? These guys can double in 20 minutes. It's a really fast in 20 minutes as opposed to like almost 20 years, right? So we can see evolution and speciation occurring at a much faster rate in things that have a shorter generation time. Random events can come in and mix things up too, right? Um, so things like if there's a bottlenecking event, if we bottleneck a, a population, that population becomes smaller, they're more likely to be impacted by the effects of genetic drift. Smaller populations are more likely to see changes in their, pop in their genetic composition due to random events, okay, like genetic drift. So maybe one population went through a bottlenecking event and the other population that they're separated from did not, right? So that might influence things. Also, different species have different mutation rates. So how quickly new mutations arise depends on the species, right? So again, something like bacteria have a much higher mutation rate than lower eukaryotes or even higher eukaryotes. Right? So in, you'd think that the more mutations arise in a population, the faster this process of speciation could occur. But sometimes we get new species that form basically in one generation, in one go, right? Um, so that we see this type of speciation, species occurring through what we call polyploidy, most often happening in plants. So this is when we have a diploid plant parent, right? So they have two copies of each chromosome. There's an error during meiosis and those sister chromatids do not separate, okay? So they make gametes that are still diploid. So this is an error, right? So we're in meiosis, we're supposed to go from diploid to haploid. Sometimes plants mess things up on accident, and when they go through meiosis, their gametes stay diploid. And plants have this additional thing where they can self-fertilize. So a diploid egg and a diploid sperm from the same plant can combine together. When that happens, so if these, this sperm and this egg were to combine together, now the resulting zygote would have four copies of each chromosome. 
say it's tetraploid. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, right? This tetraploid plant, this new tetraploid zygote, it's viable. Plants are, they're cool with having extra copies of their genome. Not a big deal to plants. But this is now a new species because this tetraploid plant, its gametes would not match up with the gametes from the original diploid plant. Right, so a prezygotic barrier now, because now this gamete, any gametes formed here would be diploid, and any gametes formed here would be haploid when it works properly. Right. So now we have a brand new plant in one generation. So this plant, this individual, can only breed with itself, which again, not ideal for plants, but they can do that. Right. And so we've only taken one generation to form a brand new species. This is actually how we get a lot of our domestic crops. So if you've ever picked like a wild strawberry right here, um, and commercial strawberries grown like on a farm are much larger, right? That's because they are polyploid. A lot of our, a lot of our commercial crops we developed through this process on accident, really, um, of creating polyploid plants. Because polyploid plants produce larger fruit. How cool is that? It's much more economical to grow something that has a much larger fruit than something that's really small. Right. So it's not necessarily the farming practices, though those help, it's the actual genetics of the plant that are different, that give it much bigger fruit. Okay, so can it happen quickly in one generation, but usually it takes much longer time. A kind of unique example of the pace of natural selection is this idea of adaptive radiation. And adaptive radiation is when one species diversifies, or one lineage diversifies into many lineages, over a very short amount of time. We've seen this happen a few times in Earth's history, and this usually happens, this adaptive radiation, one lineage goes through multiple di divergences in a very short amount of time, multiple speciation events in a very condensed amount of time. This usually happens when new stuff becomes available, new resources that that lineage could use, or new land becomes available, um, which any organism that has a genetic variation that can exploit that resource or use that specific habitat or use that food source can then go in, use that resource, and develop through natural selection adaptations that allow them to exploit that new resource that is now available. So these are Hawaiian honey creepers. Okay? So we see that from one lineage that first established itself on the Hawaiian Islands, they quickly diverged. Okay? And we think that this divergence was led mainly by the many different types of food available. So many different types of resources of types of food, these birds quickly diverged and adapted through the process of natural selection to exploit those different food resources that were available on the islands that were not available to the common ancestor from the mainland. So very quickly, rapid, rapid, rapid diversification from one lineage, adaptive radiation. Another example that we have, uh, again, this has happened many times, but these are some of the key examples, is uh, mammals and dinosaurs. Right? So mammals coexisted with dinosaurs. Okay, so mammals were around with dinosaurs. Um, we think that they were mostly kind of small, kind of like large rat-like things, uh, probably nocturnal, uh, probably ate insects or seeds of plants. But once the dinosaurs started to, to die off, Remember, the dinosaurs were the dominant species at that time. They were the ones filling up most of the niches, most of the abusing, most of the resources around at that time. They were dying off before the asteroid, but especially after that asteroid hit and we had that massive climate change, that's really when we see mammals going through this massive adaptive radiation. So dinosaurs are dying off. There's no more, there's, we relieve the pressure of predators Okay, so it's a little bit safer to go out and find food and maybe try out a new resource or try something new and different at a different time of day maybe as well. Right? Um, other maybe herbivores started to go extinct. There's new plants that you have, don't have to compete with dinosaurs for, right, to eat. So without the dinosaurs being the dominant organisms on the planet, taking up all the good stuff, all the good resources, all the good foraging spots, taking up all the space and all the time during the daylight, right? Without all of those, that competition from dinosaurs, we see a massive radiation 
of mammals after dinosaurs went extinct. So we think about 65 million years ago, right? So after that point, what this graph is showing us is the number of species within each main group of mammals, right? So we see a huge kind of like a funnel, right? It starts to get much larger, we get many more species. The number of species starts to increase dramatically after the, the demise of the dinosaurs. And again, we think that's a few things. One, dinosaurs went extinct. They were no longer, or they were declining before this as well, um, but they were no longer the main show in town, taking up all the food, taking up all the resources. So mammals could expand to take up those resources that would have been exploited by dinosaurs previously. The other big thing that we see happening right here is change in climate. Right? That asteroid we think triggered an ice age and mammals being warm-blooded, we can maintain our body temperature despite external environments, right? Reptiles are not so good at living in cold environments. Mammals definitely are, right? So a combination of those two things means that new resources, different environment, you can expand, fill in all of those gaps. Pretty cool.